is so faithful and God is so wonderful. It is exciting to be in the house of God. It's exciting to hear God speak in so many different ways. I invite you to turn with me in your scripture today to one of my favorite passages of scripture, Isaiah. Chapter 28. And I want you to follow along as we read verses 13 and 14. Isaiah 58, verses 13 and 14. A very familiar passage to some. And it has become one of the most powerful passages in my own personal ministry and life as I've watched God explode this passage of Scripture. Isaiah 58, 13, and 14. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. My message Today is entitled, Wealth, It's in Your Worship, Not in Your Works. I'll say it again. Wealth is in your worship, not in your works. Father God, as we spend this time in your word, we ask for a double anointing of your spirit. We know that unless you speak, we will not hear. Unless you touch us, we will not be transformed. And we've come to be transformed under the preaching of your word. So do it today in a special way as our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Wealth. It's a very intriguing word. In fact, wealth is a captivating word. Wealth is a tantalizing word, but I've discovered wealth is often a misunderstood word. You know for yourself that there are ambivalent feelings and sometimes anxious feelings when we mention the word wealth. But I want to bless you today. I, I want to I want to lift you up and, and help you understand what the Word of God has you and I to understand about wealth. Listen carefully. You will be excited when you hear this clear word of God about wealth. Wealth is what you are, not what you have. Oh, I need to say that again. So you've got to understand wealth is what you are, not what you have. Can I infuse you with some energy today over the subject of wealth is in your worship, not in your works? I want you to understand that you are wealth. I said it. You are wealth. I want everyone that hears this message to leave here understanding that you don't have to chase wealth. You are wealth locked up inside of, of you is the divine ore that gives you value, therefore allowing you to give value to the world. So I say again that you are wealth and you must say to yourself, I am wealth. In fact, take the time right now and say, I am wealth. Well, let's try that again. Because we struggle with the word wealth, so we don't want to say it. But I want you to know that you are wealth, so say it with me. I am 
You see, wealth is really the assignment and allocation of value. That's what wealth is. It is the allocation and assignment of value. And God assigned value to all mankind. Yeah, I think that's important for my audience to know. You have value, and God created you with value. Listen now. In the beginning, God created man, and he gave them value. He gave them value. Genesis 1-1 said, in the beginning, God created. And in that creation account, God gave man value. Created, Genesis 1-26 says, created in the image of God. Value. I need to say that again. Created in the image of God, that's value. But further, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, that's value. So no matter whether I have a lot or have a little or I have nothing at all, I am wealth. You see, all inanimate, inanimate objects, listen now, need you to give it value. Oh, I'm going to share something with you. I hope you're ready for it. You see, you give value to the world. The world doesn't give value to you. Now, I know a lot of people love BMWs. They are nice cars. But I noticed something about BMWs. That, uh, what is it, that 530i? The biggest one. It sits on the lot, and I ask the question, what value does it have? If it sits there for 10 years, all it will do is deteriorate and devaluate. Listen carefully now. Only when I get in it or you get in it does it have value. Can I repeat myself again? You see, that car has absolutely no value until I get in it. But we've gotten it so messed up today that we give it value and then we need to drive it in order to give us value. Yeah, have real mercy. You see, wealth from this perspective is very difficult for us to comprehend. Because well, wealth for most of us is about the accumulation of property, of money, and investments. So wealth is what I've earned, not what I am. Uh, let me say that again. We struggle with this definition that wealth is the assignment and allocation of value. So when we start talking about wealth, we think in terms of what we have accumulated. We think about what we have. And so wealth now is what we earn, not what we are. The Genesis story counteracts this thinking by declaring wealth is in your worship, not in your works. Genesis 1, 1, reading again. In fact, I want you to read it. I know you know it, but I want you to read it because this is a powerful passage that sets the basis for all value. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, the Word of God says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. I know that that's being redundant, but it is critical in an age when people think that we have evolved. You see, God declares from the very beginning that he is the source of all value. Therefore, he is the source and author of all wealth. He declares that I'm the one who brought this world into existence. I am the one that gives you value. Genesis chapter 2, turn with me there. Genesis chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Here again is a powerful statement about what God has done. 
Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, rather, beginning with verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God created and made. Here is Hebrew parallelism. He says in verse 2, his work he had done. His work he had done. And then in verse 3 he says, his work God had created and made. Notice the stress point here. His work, he had done. 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 He had done. The emphasis is his work. God is making it clear that man had absolutely, positively not one thing to do with the creation. It was solely the work of God. Therefore, man did not earn the worth and the wealth that they have. It is what I call grace. Man's wealth wasn't earned or deserved. It was an act of God's grace, undeserved and unearned. Undeserved, listen, and unearned. When I begin to understand that wealth is a gift from God, it should evoke from me praise. It did to David when he reflected on the goodness of God, the mercies of God, the provisions of God. Turn to Psalm 150 and watch what David does as he thinks about the God who created everything. Psalm 150. Notice what David does. He gets excited and starts praising him. He says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and the heart. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with string instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. And the reason why David did this is because he understood that his worth and his wealth was an act of God's grace. It was a gift, and therefore he understood his wealth was in his worship, not in his works. See, God understood the dangers of wealth disconnected from worth and from worship. God understood the dangers when wealth is disconnected from worship. God knew men, as the centuries pass, would catch a disease called affluenza. <laughs> That's the social disease of abundance. God knew that when we start being blessed, we would do like Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4, verse 30. We would look out over Babylon and say, look at the kingdom that I have built. Look at the house that I earned. Look at the car that I have earned. Look at the life that I have built for myself and think that it was because of our might and because of our strength. So God established the Sabbath day, a day of worship as an opportunity to express continually our gratitude for the gift 
of wealth. Notice that Adam and Eve's first day on this prosperous planet was a worship day, not a work day. It was a praise day, not a planning day. It was a praise day, not a planning day. It was a recreation day, not a recreation day. It was a shouting day, not a shopping day. It was a holy day, not a holiday. See, it was God's plan for Adam and Eve standing on the eve of the Sabbath. To look back over the six days of the creative work of God. The grass, the trees, the sun, the moon, the animals, all the creeping things of the earth, all of the prosperous things that were before them, it was God's plan for Adam and Eve to look on them and to stand in awe and amazement and say, God! I didn't do this. You did it. And I thank you for allowing me to be, be positioned in it. But it was also God's plan and God's desire for them to stand there on the eve of the Sabbath, the beginning of the Sabbath, and to look forward for six days and to say, God, everything that I will experience in the six days going forward, I will trust you for the success and I will believe you for the wealth that you will continue to sustain me with. You see, Sabbath is a weekly reminder. Your wealth, listen now, your wealth is in your worship, not in your works. Please don't miss this point. Don't leave here without understanding this. The practice of Sabbath observance, listen carefully, the practice of Sabbath observance is a public confession that you believe that wealth is a gift. It's God's emancipation proclamation. Sabbath is a reminder that God is the creator, the sustainer, and the protector of everything. It's a reminder that not only is God our righteousness, God is our wealth. You see, we are because he is, therefore we have because he is. See, the Sabbath proclamation is actually a paradox of production. Say that again. The Sabbath proclaims the paradox of production. You see, God commands that we work. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. In verse 9, the Bible says, six days shall you lay around. Six days should you be on vacation. No, he said, six days shall you labor. In other words, God does require wealth, work because wealth was work was designed by God to be a blessing because God is a God that works. And since we were created in his image, we must do like God does. We must work. But now, when we look at our work, while we put forth all of our human effort, and God wants us to put forth our human effort. But on closer examination at the work that has been done and is being, do, being done, we discover that it is God doing all the work in and through us. So it's a paradox. 
It looks like I'm doing all the work. But on closer examination, it's literally God doing all the work. Therefore, I can't get any praise or glory from it. It all has to go to God since I didn't do any work in the first place. See, the Sabbath becomes God's emancipation proclamation. And it becomes this, first of all, because it humbles us. Say, humble us. When I was a child, we used to sing this song. Humble me. Humble me. We don't sing that song anymore. But Sabbath is humbling because when we look at what has transpired over the six days, we are humble because we know it was God that did the work and translating Paul's text into our own passage for today, for by grace I am wealth, through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, lest any men should boast. So God says, when I say you are wealth, it has nothing to do with what you've done, it has all to do with what I have done. And then, after it humbles us, it liberates us. No longer are we enslaved to an endless work week. Can I get a shout, glory? No longer do we feel like we have to have 25 jobs to get ahead. Now we understand that wealth is a gift, and while God requires it to work, Listen now, our wealth is not in proportion to our work because if our wealth was in proportion to our work, we wouldn't have anything. Can I get a shout glory? So it liberates us. It enshackles us from selfishness. It unchains us from materialism. And it emancipates us from the God of work. Because we understand now, wealth is in my worship. Not in my works. See, the Sabbath emancipation is vital. Sabbath is vital. Listen to me, audience. Sabbath is vital. And the reason why in a consumer-driven economy, based on the bootstrapping philosophy, where we really believe, ha, I've done it. I pick myself up by my own bootstraps. But do you realize if you pick yourself up with your own bootstraps, you're going to land on your backside. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 8. Come on, turn to me there. Deuteronomy chapter 8. God foresaw this. He saw us. So he gave this passage, Deuteronomy chapter 8. Speaking to people who have the disease of affluenza. And for the first time in the history of America, in the first time in the, in the history of the world, people are being blessed at way beyond what we've ever thought. So God warned, and here it is, Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning with verse 11. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full, sounds like us, and have built beautiful houses, sounds like us, and dwell in them, and when your herds and flocks are multiplied, meaning you have more than one car, hallelujah, and your silver and your golds are multiplied, you got CDs and investments, and all that you have is multiplied. Listen now, when your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the projects, who brought you out of the rural America, and he blessed you, and he multiplied you. He brought you out of the house of bondage, and he led you through the great and terrible wilderness in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land which there was no water, who brought you water from the rock, and he fed you in the wilderness with manna, and he did this to prove you that I am the one who is your wealth. Can I be plain? Can I be straight? Can I shoot to you? Can I talk to your heart? Can I waken you up? Can I get you excited? Can I get you informed? 
there are only two kind of wealth. Two kind of wealth. There's what is called hellish wealth. Yeah, I said it. It's a gift straight from the devil. And then there's heavenly wealth. Both of these are gifts. Hellish wealth. Matthew chapter 4. Come on, turn with me there. Matthew chapter 4. Verses 8 through 11. The enemy of our souls, the devil himself, shows that he is the author of some of the wealth that we see around here. Matthew chapter 4, beginning with verse 8. Again, the devil took him up on an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you. Do what? Give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. The enemy understood the power of the gift of wealth. And he offered to God, listen, here are the two terms. He said, I will give you, I will give you. He understands that wealth is a gift. He said, I will give you if you will worship me. Come with me now because you've got to understand the final issues on earth, my brothers and my sisters, will be over worship. And the worship will be tied to economics, money, and wealth. Revelation 13, 6 says that they can't buy or sell, save they have the mark of the beast. That's because these are economic terms. And so worship will come to play. Understand, don't get, listen to me now, don't get envious of the wealth of the wicked. Because it was and is a gift straight from the hand of the devil. Understand the wealth of the wicked burns with pride. It's ablaze, listen, with greed. It's inflamed with selfishness. Hellish wealth is never about distribution, only about display. And I want you to listen to me. That's why the bling is so important today. Because hellish wealth it's never about distributing to our communities to help humanity, to build the kingdom of God. It's all about me and how I look so that the devil gets all of the glory. And I noticed something about hellish wealth. It strips from its owners all of its, all of its self-worth and dignity and ultimately destroys them. And then there's heavenly wealth. Hallelujah for heavenly wealth. Do you know that God makes a promise to you? A covenant of prosperity? Turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 8. I just love the word of God. I hope you do too. Because it's so plain and simple. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18. Powerful passage of scripture. That I think we overlook. Verse 18, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get poverty. Let me read that again. It, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he that gives you the power to stay broke. Listen. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. Why? That he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is today. God says, I'm giving you outward signs of my covenant by blessing you financially. You see, heavenly wealth was designed by God to humble us. And when we receive it, we say, God, we don't deserve it. We didn't earn it. And you now trust us with this heavenly wealth. And when we get it, rather than trying to buy more houses and more cars for display, we use it for distribution for the kingdom of God. We use it to bless humanity. And then heavenly wealth 
moves us, listen carefully, to total life stewardship. It moves us to say we will manage everything that God permits us to possess to his name's honor and glory, so when they look at us, they are convinced we serve a living Savior. Solomon was blessed with heavenly wealth. First Kings chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, you remember Solomon. Solomon came to the kingdom and he had enough sense to not ask for wealth. He said, God, Give me an understanding heart so that I can know how to come in and out among your people. He said, literally, God, I've seen what wealth can do. And what I need, God, is I need wisdom. Listen, church, you need wisdom when you receive wealth because while wealth is a blessing from God, there are some downsides if you don't have worship. And God says now, Let's go there and read it, 1 Kings. I think it's a powerful text. It solidifies what I've been saying. Beginning with verse 12, 1 Kings chapter 3. Beginning with verse 12. Then Solomon sat down on the throne of the Father. That's two. Let's go to three. Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise an understanding heart, he gave him wisdom, so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall there be any like arise after you. And I have also, listen now, I have also, listen now, I have also given you what you didn't ask for, both riches and honor, so that there should be no one, anyone like you among the kings of all the day. He said, I have given you. Solomon didn't earn his wealth. God gave it to him. Yeah. See, we underestimate the power of worship. We don't know that worship has transformative power. See, worship is freighted with divine power. Worship is explosive. And worship can transform wealth. Listen to me. Worship can transform wealth. It can transform hellish wealth to heavenly wealth. The story of Zacchaeus is a clear example of it. Zacchaeus, who got his wealth in the wrong way, by distortion, by cheating, by lying, but he heard about a man named Jesus who had nothing but was worth everything. And he went to find Jesus. Isn't it something how wealth will send you up a tree? And Zacchaeus goes up the tree. Jesus sees him, calls him down. And at the moment that Zacchaeus saw Jesus, he fell down. That's another way of saying he worshiped God. And in the moment of worship, his hellish wealth became heavenly wealth. How do I know? Because all of a sudden, repentance came and restitution came. When you're in the presence of God, you will repent and there will be restitution that follows. And Zacchaeus says, unsolicited by Jesus, I will give half of my goods to the poor and for forth what I have stolen, I will give back. That's what happens in the presence of God in worship. Can I excite you? Can I excite my communities? When we have true worship, things will happen in our communities, in our home. But now heavenly wealth can be changed to hellish wealth. Solomon that's just noted, was given wealth by God. You read it for yourself. You read it in the scriptures. But if you go down to 1 Kings chapter 4, you'll see that the heavenly wealth became hellish wealth. Let's go ahead and read it. 1 Kings chapter 4. Chapter 11, that is, and verse 4. Chapter 11 and verse 4. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God and was the heart, it was not like the heart of his father David. 
You know, I get really tired of hearing older people say, pray for the young folks. Like the old folks don't have any problems. <laughs> Word of God says that in his old years, Solomon allowed the women to take his eyes off of God and the wealth that he received from God as a gift now became hellish wealth and he became abusive as a leader and started worshiping and building temples to other gods. And Ecclesiastes is the sad chronicling. Listen now, a worship, a wealth rather, disconnected from worship. See, we don't know what worship is. We are confused about worship. We think worship is a religious workout. So you got some groups that will get all up in it and get all jumping around. They think that they didn't worship. That's not worship. That's a religious workout. <laughs> then there are those who believe worship is a, a spiritual tranquilizer. I come to church and God gives me an aspirin and I'm able to make it through the end of the week. And then there are those who believe that worship is a religious ritual. So they've got to have one style of worship and they go through all of the hymns in the worship book. And you can't miss one stanza. You've got to sing all 29 verses. But worship is not that. Worship is the adoration of God. It is the recognition of the awesomeness of God. It is knowing that you are in the presence of, of an, an all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful God. It is the overshadowing of the Almighty. It is experiencing the presence of God. And the German theologian Rudolf Otto said, it's experiencing the numinous tremendous or the numinous experience. Isaiah experienced it. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5, after King Isaiah died, he said he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And listen what happened. He said, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King of glory. See, true worship humbles you and breaks you down. But then it rejuvenates you because in true worship, in Sabbath worship, listen carefully, in Sabbath worship, God replenishes the value that you've given to things during the week. Oh, I feel like preaching now. See, all week long, you're exhausting your value and your worth because we don't have an unlimited source. It all comes from God. So God said, I gave it to you. Now, all week long, you're giving it out. You're giving it out so that by the time you get to Sabbath, you're done. You need a replenishing. So God says, you're humble to recognize you didn't have any. So now I'm going to replace it on the Sabbath. And so God gives us back value. That's why people who don't stop to take time with God on the Sabbath. Always feel worthless. Always feel depressed. Always feel valueless. But see, worship is not just simply an emotional encounter. God says, Isaiah, and that's our text that we let off. That's where we're coming now. Isaiah 58. He says, there is a day to worship on. He said, I've set aside a time, a day, the Sabbath day. And when you stop on my Sabbath and honor it, you'll be blessed. So there's a day, the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. That's the day. But listen now. He says, there is a way. Isaiah 58, 13 and 14 goes through and says, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a what? A delight. He said, the Lord will bless you. So the way is on Sabbath, it has to be reverent. It has to be self-denial. It has to be filled with sacrifice. It has to be focused. And it has to be celebratory. It has to be exciting. So the Sabbath ought to be the most exciting day of your life. You're praising God and saying, thank you, Lord, for the Sabbath. Because now I will be replenished in my value on the Sabbath. You see, ultimately, Sabbath is about relationship. It's a weekly reminder of my rendezvous with my lover. Uh, you see, when I love Jesus, 
All week long, I'm preparing to see him because I've been working all week and I've been away from him. But now the Sabbath becomes the time that I'm looking forward to. And I'm doing everything I can to prepare for that time. So when the Sabbath comes, I don't worry about a checklist of what I cannot do and don't do on the Sabbath. Because y'all know how so many Sabbath keepers have done. We got a checklist. You can't take a bath on the Sabbath. You can't wash your hair on the Sabbath. You can't even breathe on the Sabbath. And God says you don't need a checklist when you're coming to spend 24 hours with the one that you love. Listen, ladies, if your husband has been away for six days and he calls you and says, baby, I'm on my way home. And I'm going to commit 24 hours with you when he gets home. If he says to you, baby, I'm going to commit 24 hours with you, but I want to spend three hours watching the football game. And you will say, sister, not here in this house. Nothing wrong with the football, but you promised me that you would give me focus attention for 24 hours. And that's what God is saying on the Sabbath. If you give me 24 hours, I will love on you like you can't even imagine. You will spend time with a God who will replenish your value. And God says, not only... Is there a day? Not only is there a way, but God says there is a pay. Say pay. God makes a covenant. You read it earlier, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. He said, I'm the Lord, that God who gives you the power to get wealth, that I may establish the covenant. For years I've read this passage and I didn't understand the precious promise of prosperity in this. For years, I didn't understand that God wanted to make this covenant real so the world would know that, that, that you and I are serving a living Savior. And that's why many people are afraid to become full followers of Jesus because they do not believe that it pays to serve Jesus. But I got news for you. It pays to serve Jesus. It pays every day. It pays all the steps along life's way. Isaiah says it this way. It says, if you will delight in the Lord, I will cause you. In theology, that's cosmology. That's saying that God is the source of everything that is. He's behind or the cause behind everything that happens. And God says, since I'm the cause behind everything that happens, you don't ever have to worry about anything. If I have to call into existence something new for you, I will because I'm the creator. And if you honor me on my Sabbath, that's what I'll do. If I have to create from nothing, I will do for you. But God says, I'm not just a transcendent God. Not somebody sitting way up there in my African-American condition. It says like this, God sits high, but he also looks low. God is imminent. He's right here with us. And it's in the text. He says, I'm going to feed you. That means God is personally involved in our salvation and our wealth creation. Listen carefully now. God said, I'm not leaving your wealth creation. You need to hear this today. You need to hear this today. God doesn't leave your wealth creation to yourself, by yourself, and with other people. He is personally involved with it. He said, I'm going to feed you. And brothers, one of the most romantic things you can do with your spouse, your wife, is, oh, y'all know what I'm talking about. You feed your wife off your fork. Yeah, I saw some of y'all smile. You know, brother, when you wanted to get romantic, you got your fork and you put the little food in your, your, your girlfriend or your spouse's mouth. God said, I want to get romantic with you. On the Sabbath, I want to get romantic with you. And I'm going to put it in your mouth. And God says, you don't have to worry about what other people are getting. Listen. 
because I'm personally concerned about your welfare. Don't compare. Listen, don't compare your wealth creation with others. God is going to give you what you need. And then he said, I'm going to feed you with the heritage of Jacob, thy father. What does that mean? There are seven promises based on Jacob's heritage. Number one, he said, I'm going to give you holiness of character. God said, when you're on my Sabbath, you'll be able to live a pure life in an unholy community. Then he said, I'm going to give you the blessing of health. He said, I'm going to teach you how to live so that you, you live longer than the people in your community because I tell you about how to live. He said, I'm going to give you superior intellect. Can you imagine being 24, listen, 24, listen, 24 hours in the presence of the all-knowing God loving on you? Don't you think you'll come out being smarter? Skilled in agriculture and husbandry. Sir, superior craftsmanship, number five. Unparalleled prosperity. And then last, he said, I'm going to make you a great nation. These are the promises. And they had nothing to do with the work. It has all to do with the worship. And out of that worship, it's a covenant relationship. See, what the world needs to see from the community, from you, is that he honors his covenant. He pays. I've been married for 39 years, and don't I look good? My wife and I made a covenant. I made a covenant to her. I would take care of her. And when you see her, she's a fine woman. But if she walked in this building and she was disheveled and her hair was uncombed and her clothes were nasty and she was smelling, you would wonder about the covenant. You would say you didn't keep your part of the covenant because you were going to take care of your wife and you, it doesn't show that you do. So it is with God when he honors his Sabbath. He said, I'm going to bless you and you're going to look like something to the world. So I ask you today, will you stop trying to be wealth? Stop trying to find wealth. Stop trying to search for wealth. Why don't you just be wealth? Say again, I am wealth. Thank you, Father, for the promises that you've given we don't deserve it and we don't earn it. But God, thank you for giving us value. And now, God, on the Sabbath, we accept your value and we will carry it out into the world and we will give value to the world so that when people see us, they'll see blessings and prosperity. And then in turn, we will give them blessing and prosperity. And this is our prayer in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.